Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Rich, for your remarks. It's so great to see everyone back and ready to go. This is one of my favorite days of the, of the academic year. Convocation is such a venerable tradition, but like most traditions at Drexel, it's always being improved on. So this year, we're convening for the first time in the Recreation Center. That's a tribute to the growing popularity of convocation and a welcome news source of elbow room and air conditioning for a change. <laughs> This is also the first year that our graduate students have joined our distinguished faculty in the procession, underscoring the prominence of our graduate programs that will welcome almost 2,500 new graduate and professional students this year. So for me, convocation at Drexel definitely has a family feeling. Like most family gatherings, Convocation is a welcome chance for diverse branches of our large family of faculty and students and trustees and professional staff and alumni to come together and feel the communal pride of being one university. I should also add that numbered among our family gathering today are Drexel family descendants. I thank them for their legacy of generous support, for scholarships, the Drexel collection, and so much more. Now, it's because of all of your collective accomplishments year in and year out that the unique Drexel experience is possible. And that fuels our growing recognition as one of America's great urban research universities. So convocation is a chance for me to thank you all personally. It's also an opportunity to greet the newest members of our Drexel family, our new faculty, we'll be introduced to them later, and the incoming members of the great class of 2020, who start their first Drexel classes on Monday. This new class is one of the most distinguished and diverse we've ever had. As many of you know, two years ago, we made the difficult decision to voluntarily reduce the number of applications, which had, unreach, which had reached unwieldy 55,000 a year, so we can give each applicant the personal attention she or he deserves, and make sure what Drexel offers is a good fit with their needs and their expectations. We began this emphasis on getting the right students, and I'm happy to report that it's working. The, one, the current one-year retention rate for the class of 2015 is 88.7%, which is at an all-time high, and we think we'll make more progress from there. This year, we have admitted another freshman class very well suited for our university, and we're very, very excited about what they will accomplish. Convocation 2016 is also an historic milestone. It comes as the kickoff to Drexel's 125th year celebration. Even in a city as historic as Philadelphia, 125 years is a long time. Certainly long enough for a university to develop its own time-honored traditions. But our greatest tradition, I would submit, has always been innovation. That tradition goes back to our founder, Anthony J. Drexel. The famous banker and philanthropist founded Drexel in 1891 as the Drexel Institute of Art, Science, and Industry. And against the backdrop of America in the late 19th century, his goals for Drexel were innovative to the point of being radical. As the founder once put it, he wanted a Drexel education to be not only good, but good for something. He planted the intellectual seed for what would later become Drexel's cooperative education approach and make us a global model for combining academic depth and excellence with intensive career discernment and preparation. He also founded Drexel with the powerful idea that admission should not be limited by race, gender, religion, or socioeconomic status. That kind of inclusion is expected on all campuses in America today, but it was the exception in 1891. And I like to think that the head start we got 125 years ago set the stage for a strong commitment to inclusion and the kind of civic engagement that's such a big part 
of who we are today, especially here in Philadelphia. We remain hard at work on our goal of making Drexel the most civically engaged university in the United States. The Schuylkill Yards Innovation District we announced this spring is a major step toward that goal. With our partners investing billions of dollars of development costs, we are free now to take the intellectual lead in a project that will transform the gateway to Drexel into a multi-purpose innovation district with academic and commercial buildings and a magnificent public park to be known as Drexel Square. Schuylkill Yards will create substantial long-term employment opportunities for our neighbors in Mantua and throughout West Philadelphia, not by chance, but by design. And as it develops over the next two decades, it will result in new co-op jobs for our students and research and commercialization opportunities for our faculty. So right now it's time to hear from our guest speaker who's traveled across the country to be with us this morning. In his 14 years as president of Arizona State University, Michael Crow has enthusiastically taken on the mission of transforming Arizona State into the model of a public research university that measures itself by inclusivity and not exclusivity. Despite the familiar challenges of rising costs and shrinking public funds, he has moved mountains in terms of offering students from low-income families a high-quality education delivered in so many innovative ways. His creative use of technology and strategic partnerships has bolstered Arizona State's academic reputation and landed him on Time Magazine's list of the 10 best university presidents. Suffice, suffice it to say that he is one of the most respected agents of change in American higher education today. And when they write the book about this generation of leadership, in my mind, he will go down as the most significant change agent of all. So please join me in welcoming my mentor and my friend and today's conv convocation speaker, Dr. Michael Crow. Thank you, uh, John, and thank you for the invitation to be here on such an important day. I can't help but remember the same day that I had 43 years ago when I showed up to college. Uh, my dad, um, trying to get my Apple Watch to work here. My, uh, it works. My, my dad was really mad at me. I'd been admitted to the Air Force Academy and decided not to go. I came from a working class family, and he said, you know, they pay for everything there. Your, your clothes, your food, your books, your tuition. They give you a summer job, and they guarantee you a job when you're done. What are you in? I didn't raise an idiot. Why aren't you going there? I decided to go to another college, and he drove, drove me. I was only 17. I didn't have a car. He drives me to Iowa State University, where I was going to be a javelin thrower, which I, I was. And so, uh, I, and, but he didn't speak to me. That's a six hour drive. We slept in a relative's driveway that night before he took me up to Iowa State, and it was the day that he could drive me, and I remember this vividly like it was yesterday. We arrive, he pulls up to the dorm, I pull out my trunk in which every worldly possession I had was located from working at Boy Scout camp, it was my Boy Scout trunk, and he said, well, maybe we'll see you at Christmas. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Unfortunately, who's a student? Who's an incoming student? Yeah, unfortunately, I was five days early. <laughs> so I show up at the dorm and the room's not ready. And um, I, I, I sort of have a situation. I don't actually have any money on me, like five bucks. They're, they said that you know, the dorm would have food, and so that, that's what I was going to eat. And so I remember them saying, well, you look like you're strong. Maybe you can work helping us to set up bed. So I got a job within like 30 minutes of arrival. <laughs> they had some little place for me to stay. And then I remember something which is actually something I remember so vividly, it's actually what I'm going to talk about today. So after those five days, I remember going over and signing up and, and getting ready, and you go into this room and they say, well, what do you want to study? What's your major going to be? 
I said, major? What's a major? No, no, one, no one in my family had ever been to college. I mean, literally, I'm like, what's a major? Well, like what you want to focus on. I said, well, how would I know I'm only 17 years old? How would I know? Here's what I'm interested in. I'm interested in engineering. I'm interested in politics. I'm interested in linguistics. I'm interested in history. I'm interested in a whole bunch of things. So I want to major in all of those. <laughs> and the lady sits there and she goes, well, you can't do that. You got to pick one thing. I said, who came up with that? I was like a little sort of argumentative kid. <laughs> who, who came up with the notion you had, to, you had to major in one thing? What idiot came up with that, <laughs> with that idea? So remember that, that's 43 years ago. Iowa State University, which is a science and technology oriented university. And so my thinking became seared. So I ended up majoring in several things. I ended up majoring in science and social science and taking lots of engineering courses and taking 60 hours of independent study as an undergraduate because the fact they ultimately just sort of gave up on me and said, well, yeah, just write a paper and turn it in and we'll grade it. You, you guys that came in as freshmen, you'd, you'd like this. But here's the problem. We have a problem realizing where we're sitting. Drexel University, right here today in Philadelphia. We are sitting inside one of the single most important types of institutions human beings have ever built. And we're at one of the best of those. And what do I mean by that? Well, in all of the eons that we've been developing as a species, in the latter recent years, we decided to build these things called universities where we gather eminent thinkers and dreamers and, and, and communicators and conceptualizers and designers, and we bring them together into these institutions called universities, and we do this so that we might gather with those people learners. And we do that so that at the end of the day, our single most important purpose as an institution is to literally create the future by establishing the learning process that we implement and allowing new designers of that future to be emerged. That is the process that we are engaged in. And this particular institution, Drexel, for those of you coming in as students, you may not know this, that you're sitting now as a part of one of the last remaining free independent universities not trapped in the box of playing a game wherein the entire identity of the institution is built on who you didn't admit. This is an institution with a purpose. This is an institution driven by its founder to its present day to do something, to make a difference. Now let me take that, cl that cliche of make a difference and put some edge on it. John's office was bugging me for a while and my staff was bugging me saying, they want a title, they want a title, they want to know what you're saying, they want to put it in a book. I said, I don't know what I'm gonna say until I stand up, but I'll, I'll send them I'll send them a title. So the title I sent was Inventing the Future Through the Design, Through Design. Inventing the Future Through Design, The Ultimate Art. And I'm gonna come back and play on those words, particularly for you new freshmen coming in, but also for the faculty and the board and the, and the, and the staff that are here. Because what better place than Philadelphia, the city in which the process of the design of our country was actually put down onto blueprints. Before that, there was argument, conflict, war, everything that you can imagine. And then there were blueprints. A design conceptualization emerged in this place, the Constitution of the United States. There's a bunch of people that think that it's somehow a fixed thing that you need to pay attention to as if it's the Bible. It's a living, design. It's an interactive design. It's a living, breathing thing that was created in this city. So this city in and of itself has and could claim and should claim 
that this is where it started. This is where the design emerged. Now this design way of thinking is very different than the way that most colleges and universities work. Most colleges and universities, and I'm not putting Drexel into this category, are bureaucracies run by rigid thinkers who believe that their principal role is to protect some small piece of the institution. Like when I went to college, you can only major in one thing. You have to follow this path. You have to do this, you have to do that, you have to do this. That the learning process is somehow a process of like engaging with a government agency to figure out your, your learning path. So this notion of inventing the future through design and creating that through the process of what I call the ultimate art, this is a space in which this university, Drexel, the university that I'm a part of, Arizona State, are trying to forge a new direction. Can you create an institution in which the product is not an engineer or a scientist or an accountant or an artist? Literally, literally, the fact that I can't even look at the fact that when I say this because I'll just be getting some darts back from them maybe. Really, you want to call a 21-year-old product of your college an artist, an engineer, a scientist, as opposed to those are the skills that they have learned through so that they are now an enabled designer. So I'm gonna come back to that. And so this is an institution I think where the future can be created through design by recognizing that in fact the learning process is in and of itself, this is why I use the term ultimate art and art. The learning process is not a science. You may learn science, but you don't learn it technically. You learn it in a completely new and differentiated way by finding a way to do something very, very different. Now, I'm going to speak directly to the freshmen as a way to try to articulate this point. Now, this is a point that shoots over the head of lots of people. They'll say, I have no idea what that man is talking about. So I'm going to talk directly to the students. So how many of you are here to study? How many of you are here to get a degree? How many of you think your degree will get you a job? How many of you are really hopeful that your degree will get you some kind of job? <laughs> and I'm going to say that's all good, but that's actually a secondary variable. The faculty who are sitting up here in front, in my view, have one assignment. Their assignment is to create an environment in which you as a student can become a master learner, a person capable of learning anything. You may find that path of learning on an engineering track. You may find that path of learning on an art history track. You may find that path of learning studying philosophy or science or chemistry or information technology, let me tell you, that doesn't make any difference. The learning path doesn't make any difference. What makes a difference is that you find a way to evolve yourself into being a master learner. Now, it turns out that the core of the spirit of Drexel, from founding forward, from the civic mindedness, from the things that President Fry just said about emerging as the greatest American university deeply connected to its city and the success of its city. That becomes the design platform, the design focus, and the process is the creation of this learning environment. Now, how many of you as incoming students think of yourselves now as master learners? capable of learning anything. Yeah, no one's gonna raise their hand. <laughs> Even if they think it, they're not gonna raise their hand. <laughs> but now imagine that somehow in your learning environment with this faculty, in this city, 
with the cooperative programs, with the internship programs, with the connection programs, with the linkages, with all the things that are going on and all the problems that you can work on. Imagine the entire institution was devoted to nothing but your success at mastering the process of learning. If that occurs, one thing then I know is certain that all this gibberish that you hear out in the political discourse around the United States and elsewhere these days, gibberish, 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 arguing, gibberish, back and forth. Anybody heard any of that? (laughs) None of that's about design. None of that's about solving the real deep-seated problems. Let me give you an example of a problem. Is it possible to create technologies from an institution like Drexel that actually think about at the time that the technology is emerging, the social, cultural, and economic consequences of that technology such that one could derive technological progress without massive disruption of the society, so much so that we end up with societies that are completely fragmented around the technological progress that the society has made. Now, how many of you students believe you could answer that question right now and produce those kinds of technologies? None of you. How many of you think that you'd be able to do that just by studying engineering? You won't be able to. Just by studying science, you won't be able to. Just by studying art, you won't be able to. And so the point that I'd like to make in this convocation, which is this gathering for initiation of this faculty and this student body is that the opportunity exists in a significant way to have a changed mindset at Drexel. What do we do at Drexel? We produce master learners. What do those master learners do? They create the future. How do they create the future? Differently than the other hard, rigid, fixed institutions. We're committed to the city. We're committed to the city and its future. We're committed to doing things in which humanity is lifted while the economy is grown at the same time where fairness is a product. I don't know how you measure fairness. It's so difficult, people often say that it's not measurable, but you all know what it means. And so the point is, is that to you students, you have dropped in, you are parachuted in to one of the most significant institutions that exists with a faculty that has assembled to devote their lives to you. And the one outsider advice that I would give to both the faculty and to the students is focus on mindset. The mindset of creating master learners and driving forward with those master learners to the title that I was asked to give to invent the future through design, the ultimate art, the art of learning. Thank you.